Okay. Okay. Hi everyone. It's so good to have this opportunity to speak to you on this very important webinar subject. So I thought we would begin by showing you Andara crystals, which actually are loved by angels. All minerals are. And in our title, we didn't use the word angels, but I'm going to briefly speak about them. Here is Archangel Michael's beautiful crystal, which looks like the sea. Wonderful crystal. And here is one that I meditate on often, which is like a little silvery green boat full of bubbles. And these all came from the Sierra Mountains in Northern America on Native American Indian sacred ground. Now, angels, unlike the guides and the masters, which we are talking about in our title, never ever were incarnated. So as our flesh is the densest form of spirit, the angels never ever came back. They are emanations from the Godhead. And so no matter how good we are in our lives, we can never become angels. It's not possible. It's a different stream of consciousness. So the angels have specific jobs to do. Angels of joy, angels of happiness, angels of healing. But the one that we connect with most is our guardian angel. And our guardian angel is appointed at birth. And looking at the next category that we have, that we are going to talk about today, we're looking at masters. And masters and guides are very often confused. They are not the same thing at all. Masters have been in the corporate form. They have been incarnate like us. Many, many, many hundreds of lifetimes they purify themselves and they became completely detached from the desires of the world. And so there we have the difference, if you like, between guides which are a bit cozier, I almost feel, and masters which are at a higher level because they are archetypal. And the masters which govern the world, the ascended masters, have had initiations into the fifth and sixth dimension. And that makes them very, very special indeed. Now looking at the names of the lords of the rays who are the ascended masters, there are these. First, El Moria, who's in charge of India and is all about wisdom. And then there's Lord Lanto, who's all about the spoken word. And that is the United States. And then we have Paul the Venetian, who is connected with southern France. And Paul the Venetian is all to do with discerning spirit. Serapis Bay, another ascended master, Lord of the Rays. And Serapis Bay is connected with Egypt and with miracles. Hilarion connects with Crete and is all about healing. And Lady Nada connects with Saudi Arabia and has everything to do with interpretation of speaking with tongues. And Saint Germain 
is a miracle worker and connects with Romania and Wyoming. So just as we have seven chakras on our body, the earth has seven chakras over its whole surface, all different colors that correspond with our colors of our chakras. Now to come to a different aspect, away from the masters, and the masters have got specific purpose in life. I personally feel the word master is used way too lightly. We think about Mahatma Gandhi, a true master. We think about Christ who was called the master by the apostles, the disciples. And then we speak about no disrespect to anybody who is in fact a Reiki master as I am myself. I call it Reiki one, two, and three. Because to me, master has a very, very specific, deeply spiritual and very advanced energy. So to come to our lovely guides, and that feels warmer, it feels more snug in a way, we can chat to our guides. And our guides also have incarnated many, many times as people, just as this flesh is the densest form of spirit, they have many, many lifetimes in our dimension, in our physical reality. And then when they've done enough in their own preparation for their soul's development, they don't need to come back in this format anymore, but they're there to help us. So the guides can be seen in a variety of ways. We might see them as a friend that we can call on whenever we've got a problem. We might see them as a priest. We might see them as a holy man. We might see them as someone who is a healer. We might see them as someone who helps us if we're writing, somebody who helps us creatively. They wear many, many guises. And when we think of them, so many people ask me, can you please tell me what my guide's name is? Can you see what my guide looks like? Well, the guide's names that I can see are never things like Gildas or um, any other name, perhaps like Sergei or names like Savas. They don't give me that. But when it's an archangel who is a guide for that person, then they will say Archangel Michael. Archangel Gabriel, Archangel Uriel, and Archangel Raphael. And if I see that, I know this person sitting opposite me is on a very, very high level indeed on their life soul path. Now I know living in Cyprus that every time I go into my car, because there's a lot of reckless driving here, especially when it gets hot, which it is at the moment, I always say, Archangel Michael, please help me. I invoke him always when I get into my car. And most of my friends of all ages, both sexes do the same. In Cyprus, where I live, there is also a saint who is very, very well known and helps people enormously. And his church, which is along the coast, is full of babies made of wax and walking sticks and supports for the back where people have been healed. It is a miraculous healing place. And so Cypriots will say, and Greeks who revere Saint Raphael, that when they're very close to death, he's by the door of the bedroom. But when they are going to recover he's right by the bedside so i know this will be the same in all countries all over the world 
there will be bridges of light between the worlds and there will be accessing guides, masters, angels. And of course, saints are people who have evolved through leading amazing lives, like Mother Teresa, for example, whose life was totally about service. So how to connect with them? Now I'm going to do three exercises in this particular webinar. And there will be gaps when you're asked to sit quietly. So please don't think that the webinar has stopped. It's simply that you will be asked to sit quietly, okay? So before we go on to the first exercise, looking at all these beings of light who interpenetrate our lives, our person, our friendship circle, our friends, our country, our village, when there is that connection of faith and hope and trying to raise the energy through optimism, through cheerfulness, through giving loving help and assistance, that goes out exponentially all over the world. And it's so important to realize that I attended some years ago a very brilliant speaker who was in the College of Psychic Studies in London and he was speaking about the light workers and the interconnection between us in the physical realm and the bridge of light between those at a higher realm. And at the end, he said, he was an excellent speaker, at the end he said, do any of you have questions? And I stood up, it was a huge auditorium, I was quite nervous really. And I said, yes, I have one. If God is the ultimate, the creator, emanating pure love, pure goodness, why do we have to bother with all these in-between stages? Like the guides, like the masters. And there was a long pause and he answered it obliquely, but in a beautiful way. He said, there are oceans, there are seas, there are lakes, there are rivers, there are streams. And some people feel safer being close to a stream. And some people love the immensity of the ocean. I never forgot that, and it seems to apply in this case. Why are there all these divisions and levels of light beings? And how can we connect with them? Now we can do it ourselves by using simple exercises, which I will give shortly. But they can also be induced. And they can also come when the guides themselves speak openly to us in a way that we can hear. And as I said in my last webinar, which some of you may or may not have watched, when we hear the voice clearly outside of us, not in our heads, but clearly as you hear me now, and you hear words like run, go now, climb, imperative mood and instruction, with urgency behind it, then you move, you either climb or you run. A husband and wife and many others who were running away from a tsunami, and she was a very sensitive woman, heard clearly her guide saying, climb. She grabbed her husband by the hand and climbed, and everyone else on that beach who was running away sadly perished. So, they can intercede for us when we are in danger. Now, I heard about a bed that was made by a brilliant physicist. He had worked all over the world with top Russian engineers, scientists, American ones, British ones, Asian ones, um, 
people at the top level of their scientific understanding of physics. And he, being a very spiritual man, remember Einstein said, science and spiritualism go together. Sometimes one is slightly ahead and sometimes the other is. But they always come to the same conclusion at the end because they're both absolute truths. Now, usually, in my understanding, it's the spiritual people who get the scientific knowledge first. And then the scientists say, that is correct. Occasionally, it's the other way around. But both, like two streams of different knowledge, come together perfectly. Science and spirituality completely are absolute truths. So I wanted to see this bed experience it. I knew many healing beds and healing carpets and healing mats, and I thought, great. They help heal the emotional. They help heal the physical. Wonderful. I wonder what this bed is going to be like. So my friends drove me up to New York State, and I went into the room and lay down, and there was, I wouldn't call it music, it was certain notes, not really following a melodic pattern. And the very first plane that I visited was a green field, a richer green than any green I've seen in my life, full of daisies and white sheep. I stayed in that field for a long time. This was beyond time. And then there was a feeling of being lifted up to a higher level. And in that level was an unforgettable sight. There was a violet sea and a wooden boat and a Christ-like figure sitting in the boat. And the love that emanated from that was like nothing I've experienced in my life. I was there for a long time. Another shift upwards. And there was a deep indigo sky full of constellations and stars that I have never seen before, full, full of constellations and stars and galaxies, infinity. And then the session ended and I couldn't speak. I was beyond speech. The scientist who had made this bed watched me as I left his office. And I went out to a stream with a bridge and I stood looking down. I couldn't speak. After about half an hour, I went back and he said to me, could you please tell me what you experienced? And I described it all as I've described it to you. And he said, I have to tell you that every mystic who has experienced that bed has had the identical experiences that you have described. So when he told me that, I knew that these were actual places in the inner planes. Because we couldn't be telepathically sending out to strangers exactly the same pictures. It was more than a picture. We were there, present. In a way that was induced, that was going into higher planes via a bridge of physics. As I've already explained, when the guides want to warn us, being loving friends, 
then they speak in monosyllabic ways, usually in an imperative mood with urgency. Now, how do we make the bridge? Remembering that our guides may appear to us in different guises, depending on our cultural background, depending perhaps on our religion, or perhaps despite our religion, that we have none. So they will appear to us in different ways. Now, how to create the bridge? Sitting very quietly and closing your eyes. Keeping your eyes closed, begin to relax. See yourself sitting in the chair that you particularly feel comfortable in and say to your guides telepathically, I will sit in this chair every day at whatever time you decide to allocate for five minutes, let's say. I know we have busy lives. And you say telepathically to the guides, please give me a sign of your presence. So as you're sitting in that chair, almost daydreaming, depending on which is your strongest sense, is it sight, sound, touch, smell? If, for example, you have sight as your strongest sense, then you may see, even with your eyes closed, a picture of your guide. If it's through sound, that's your strongest sense, you may hear a lyric of a song or one word or a musical note. If it's through touch, you might feel the tiniest little touch against your skin, almost like a feather. And if it's through scent, you might inhale the fragrance of a rose or a lily or lavender or violet. And once you get that proof, it may take two or three days. But once you have that proof, I can connect with my guides by sitting like the Pharaoh with nothing crossed, my back straight, because your spine is the lightning conductor, then you know they're connecting with me. When I'm doing my work, my spiritual work, whether I'm talking to someone in a session or whether I'm recording a lecture or a webinar or a seminar, I see a butterfly, the same one, that comes across in front of my French window all of the time. And I know I'm being given encouragement by that butterfly. And so begin to look. The angels connect with us through synchronicity and angelic numbers. The guides, you can say to them, to really believe what I'm experiencing, I would like please for three proofs that three times you may give me that song, or three times you might touch my cheek very lightly like a feather. Now that's something you can do every day and it's enormously therapeutic. Not only are you going to a higher level spiritually, but you're slowing down your heart, your heart rate, you're slowing down the busyness of your brain, all of that. Now, going to look at how to make the connection of light between the guides and you. 
one of the things where our guides can connect very easily with us is when we're in a quiet place. It has to be a quiet place. We can't have distractions. We can't have meetings with our guides when children are running around having a great time as they should with their toys and rattling and all the rest of it, which is their right, lovable beings that they are. And we can't connect with our higher guides if we're in a busy traffic and we've almost got our fingers in our ears wanting to be still and quiet. So it has to be a still and quiet place. So look to the mountains. If you think of the holy men who would go into the caves in the mountains of all cultures, of all faiths. Think about the roots of a tree going into the earth. Think about the crown of the tree going up to the sky and standing underneath and looking through the leaves and branches of the tree into the sky. Look at the river that flows, taking away everyone's problems. Look at the sea, which has seen everything, wars, pestilence, disease, everything, and still the rhythm of the sea is rhythmically coming towards you as the tide comes in and the tide goes out. Look at the sky and the peace and tranquility that looking at the clouds of the sky give. Look at a bank of flowers in all their beauty and purity. That is the kind of environment in which to make an easy connection with your guides. Now, there will be a pause, so it's to allow you to be inwardly in that still quiet place. So sitting very comfortably, watching your breathing, feeling the breath rising and falling as you listen to my voice, rising and falling, feeling so peaceful. You turn your thoughts to your heart and you see your heart center opening like the petals of a rose and see that image of the petals opening to expose the beautiful yellow center traveling into that yellow center that center of stillness and peace and quietness. Remain in that place, in the center of the rose, in the center of the heart. Feeling that peace which has become 
a part of you in that stillness, very gently close the petals of the heart, the petals of the rose, the petals of the heart. And keeping that sense of calm and knowing that this is your way of contacting what is higher than ourselves. Be aware of your breathing as you breathe more deeply. As you become more aware of your surroundings. And be aware of the floor under your feet. And now, breathing more lightly and feeling happy and joyful that you can so easily use that beautiful exercise to take you into that place of inner stillness and beauty. So you may say, I will find a place where I can have communion, not only within the house or on this particular chair that you're sitting in now or another. You might say there's a place that really pulls me and I feel different energy there. And trust your own gut instincts. You're all sensitives who are listening and taking part in this webinar. We are all together building light as we are doing this. And not only are we doing it at this earth plane, but we're doing it in the higher planes, building light as we are doing this, as we're participating, listening, using our own vibrations in conjunction with everyone else, with love and connection. And think of that one place that you may say, that is my favorite place, maybe under that tree in the garden, maybe that little spot by the sea, maybe that little rocky place where nobody else goes, only me, you might say. And make that your special place. Someone many years ago told me that they were buying a house because there was one place that really pulled them in the northern part of America. And the guides through me said straight off, it's a place of prayer. It's a spur of rock. And the Native American Indian chiefs would have prayed there. And they said, yes, that's exactly right. And that's why we chose it. So they felt both sensitives that that home pulled them. And it doesn't have to be a distant place. It can be in your garden. It can be if you're walking to work or taking the metro to work, you might see a building that you have a particular rapport with and think how skillful and brilliant the architects were who made that particular shape, like the ship's sail. And you might then find that even in that metro, that you go to that place of appreciation, of joy, of harmony, of beauty, 
sharing that with the person who designed it. Now, animals are a very big part also of our life. And they add a great deal to it, giving unconditional love and wisdom. And for those who feel they have a connection with the animal kingdom, which is of course part of our nature of the earth, you can do this. Closing your eyes and finding an aperture in the ground. It may be that it's a dry, a dry gully. It may be that it's a hole in the ground. It may be it's in the roots of the tree with a little cave within it. It may be like a potholer's dream. But choose your way of going into the earth. And feel it. Feel the texture. Feel how closely the sides, perhaps, of a tunnel or a cave are almost brushing your shoulders. Feel the excitement of being in a hidden place where there's only dim light coming through cracks in the earth above you. And so you go on smelling the earth, that beautiful rich loam. And as you go along, twisting and turning, going ever deeper, you come to the center of a spot, of a place that is a little like a curved dish. And as you stand there looking, you have a feeling that something is going to emerge there that is important to you. some being, some creature. Let it come towards you now. And as you look at it, feel the character of that being. Feel a heart connection with it. As you feel its energy permeating your auric field. Feel the love that's coming from this creature. See the attributes of it. See how you connect with this. And feeling that it has become a part of you, a part of your being that you will always hold dear and that in a sense it's a protector for you. And with gratitude in your heart, you thank this being, this creature that you have met deep in the earth a gift from Mother Nature, bowing with reverence towards this creature, you turn to navigate all the twists and the bends of the rock or the earth, the tree roots, as you retrace your steps.
knowing you have been given a treasure. And as you approach the entrance where you entered, you see the light, daylight again. And pushing through, you give thanks for the sun. You give thanks for the energy all around you. You give thanks to the earth. And you have your treasure within your heart. For people who are drawn to shamanism and who feel the deity in everything, like animists do, the being of light that governs the waterfalls, the beings of light within the minerals, the beings within trees. If you are that, then shamanism is a very good way of connecting with your guides and the masters. Now, looking at the guides and how we see them, or don't see them, simply feel their presence around us, it's very helpful when other sensitives, and we are all sensitives here at this moment, it's very useful when other sensitives will say, I saw your guide. And you may say, really, can you describe him or her? Because there is no division in the field of spirit. And it can be very interesting. Of course, we usually have experiences in our lives where our guides make themselves known to us. And I won't go into my own because it's not of interest to anyone else. Um, the first one I saw was coming down an amphitheater and there were seven rows of stone. And when that being came down and connected with me, I knew that that was my guide. And in that time, I saw him, but I didn't need to see him again because the connection is so fast, just so fast. And another where I was in a solar boat in a very wide river, which I now know is the River Nile, so strong a connection with ancient Egypt was totally familiar to me the first time I went, as I'm sure it would be to nearly all of us sitting here, because ancient Egypt is a very, very special place, and Egypt today is a very special place. And in that, I was in a solar boat, and the baby was born, and I could feel tiny golden wings between its shoulder blades. That stayed so, so clearly in my mind. And I believe that was the healing gift. One was the seeing gift and one was the healing gift. But others have seen the protector behind. And it's important to realize that guides don't stay with us all the time. It's like the changing of the guards. Say you were a healer, but you didn't use your healing modality. Then the healing guide would go away and find a better, easier match to work with. Say you were a writer, and the, gu the guide who would help with your writing was there. Let's say you were a seer. Then the guide who's there for your seeing capabilities if you're not using that, we'll go away and find a better match. So that is 
an ongoing process all of the time. Your guardian angel is a constant, right from the time you're born, right till the time you die. And it is important also, this is another misconception that people have, but it's a, a very understandable one. When you're grieving because someone you loved has passed, yes, you will feel them around you. And that is correct, absolutely. Because they come back on the vibration of love. It's magnetic. But they're not our guides. Because when we die, we die at a certain level of what we've been able to attain in our lifetime. We don't suddenly become a saint when we're up there, or out there, or in there, beyond dimensions. We have exactly the same spiritual knowledge and understanding when we go through as at the point of our ending. So when people think, my grandfather is my guide, no. He may well be a loving spirit who comes just to say, you okay? Great, I'm still around you. Never worry, that love will always be a constant. That's beautiful, but that's not a guide. So the guides are there because they're at a higher level. They've gone through all the processes of suffering, terror, fear, all the things that we have, joy and happiness and elation and all of that. But then they grew beyond that to be archetypal and not connected with the earthly desires that we all feel oh, perhaps we should have a bit more money, oh, there isn't enough love in my life, or oh, all the things that we all have to go through. So your guides are not your deceased relatives, but your deceased relatives are absolutely alive in the next dimension, coming back, maybe showing themselves to you as a young woman. Um, my mother was in her 60s when she passed, but she was 40 when I was born, so I never knew her as a young woman. But when she comes to see me, she is a beautiful young woman, probably in her 20s. And I think, isn't that great? I'm able to see her as she was. And I think when people pass, they're able to choose where they were happiest. That's my belief. So even if somebody's 99, and exhausted with life, they can come back as a very vigorous 30-year-old. I believe that's their choice. But your guides are not your relatives. Your guides are those who are drawn to you because you've got affinities with them. And it's for producing more light, more healing, more love in the world that the interaction takes place. So guys are, I, I just like to refer them as kind of cozy, friendly things, beings. But others might see them as learned teachers um, and so on. It's up to you, but build a rapport with them by talking to them by discussing things with them, sharing things with them. Because that is an amazing weaving ourselves in the material plane and then the different levels within the planes of light. It's amazing. And the more we interconnect, the higher and lighter and brighter the energy of the world is. And that's what we should be doing to raise the energy in these times through prayer, through meditation, through invocation. Remember, invocation is different from prayer. Invoking is going specifically, let's say to Archangel Michael, Archangel Michael, help me now. Three little words a five-year-old would understand and then the grace flows into your life. Without the invitation, that can't happen. 
because then they bypass our willpower. Can't happen. So guides are there. We can link with them. And just like a good friendship, it grows from shared experiences, sharing life, sharing fun. Very often, when I'm doing my work as a seer, I hear such laughter in the inside planes, and I know that they're happy, and perhaps they're sharing a joke with the person who's sitting opposite, and that's lovely, because the more laughter there is, the more happiness there is, the higher the energy goes. So if we're spiritual, we should be happy, we should be connecting with our guides, and not worrying about, oh, it has to be this time of day, that time of day, I've got to give two hours. No, we can't do that in our todays, but you can do a fleeting moment here, a fleeting moment there. You can say, the, like the Cathars prayer at the beginning of the day, take my day, then everything's incorporated in it. So we make that connection. So we have one foot in the spiritual, one foot in the material, making a triangle of light. And those are ways of building bridges, making communications. And remember, your crystals are beloved by the angels. Back to the Andara again, full of light. There are so many rainbows in this. And I thought it was a, a quartz, a rock quartz, until an expert in crystals said straight off, this is an Andara, it's natural glass. How lucky you are. So I'm sharing the energy with the Andaras, with you, as you participate in this webinar. And to conclude, we'll have a little bit of the elven chimes, the healing chimes. So closing your eyes. Now, if you have any questions, please send them to me at Anne Austin Triple Eight, A for Apple, N for November, N for November, E for Edward, A for Apple, U for Umbrella, S for Sugar, T for Terry, I for Indigo, N for November, Triple Eight at G for Good, Mail. Dot com, and I will get back to every one of you who writes. Thank you for attending this webinar, and thanks to Pia, as always.